to uh, friends and colleagues in uh, Singapore and Vancouver. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, and uh, it's really a great pleasure to uh, welcome everyone to, to what's our, our first virtual uh, joint symposium uh, on research. Uh, we, we plan today to uh, highlight research in healthy ageing at both institutions. And of course, this, this event builds on very strong connections between UBC Faculty of Medicine and Li, Li Kong Chan School of Medicine. Uh, Dern, of course, was Dean of LKC Medicine uh, when he's also Dean at Imperial. And I succeeded him uh, in Singapore as Dean of LKC Medicine back in 2014. And we have had joint symposia before. Uh, in, in Vancouver and then in Singapore, we had, in those were the days, we had in person uh, fantastic uh, symposia. Uh, it's a few years ago now, but there have been several highly successful ongoing collaborations. And of course, last year, uh, I think it was in July, we had a uh, joint symposium between LKC Medicine uh, UBC and Trinity College Dublin and that was quite tricky with the timing. Uh, it was on education in the COVID-19 era. So today's meeting is built on a, a very firm foundation of uh, collaboration and interaction and uh, I have no doubt it will strengthen our ties and lead to a closer partnership uh, and, and that will be endorsed by the agreement that uh, we will complete shortly. So uh, we are very grateful to our UBC colleagues uh, for your support in, in uh, fostering, strengthening this collaboration. And uh, to the administrative team, thank you for putting together a, a great program for us today. We've all had a very challenging past year and staying connected with friends and colleagues has been difficult. And I, I want to take the opportunity uh, because my role as Dean will finish at the end of March. I, I, I want to take the opportunity to thank you, Dermot, for your uh, friendship and collegiality over the past seven years and for your ongoing support of LKC Medicine. I hope uh, that uh, everyone will enjoy today's meeting and that it's not too long bef before we can meet up again in person for our third uh, in, in person meeting. And I hope uh, that I might be able to uh, at attend that as an observer. So thanks again and over to you, Dermot. Thanks very much, James. And it's really great to see you and uh, delighted that we're able to come together in 2021, even if it is virtual. And uh, hopefully, uh, before too long, we will be able to come together in person. Um, I want to say hello to everyone here. Uh, I'm Dermot Kelleher. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Vice President of Health at UBC. Uh, and I spent uh, uh, happy times at, at, at the Lee Chan School um, uh, as, as Dean uh, before James uh, took, took over and, and led it to bigger and better things. Um, the Lee Kong Cheng School is quite an extraordinary entity. I just want to say this. It has a totally unique pedagogical approach and it has been able to build uh, really great strengths in, in research in a relatively short space of time. And uh, I think several of the people on this call today will have been on the visits uh, to, to Lee Kong Cheng. And, and, and have made, several people have, have made some very strong and lasting friendships and research collaborations as a consequence. We're here right now. I just want to acknowledge that uh, UBC's Vancouver campus is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. And uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that you're joining us to, today from many places near and far and acknowledge all the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. And on behalf of UBC, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome you all 
uh, to this joint symposium on, on this really important uh, subject of aging and looking at both genetics and environmental factors. I think this is going to be one of the key areas of research over coming years, how do genetic and environmental factors uh, mesh in the causation or the uh, or, or as factors uh, influencing the course of disease. Now, you know, uh, one way of gauging aging, uh, so uh, you, you know you're getting old, and I, I know I'm getting old. When I, when I look at the speakers, and there's a, there's a, a, a speaker by a, a, an international leader in, in an area uh, like the microbiome uh, that uh, you first encountered when you interviewed them for, a, uh, for their first uh, junior fellowship in research, and here they are uh, um, uh, talking about uh, some uh, really outstanding work. That's, uh, I, I, think, I think we're in for a treat here, Sanjay, um, because uh, I, 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 I've heard advance uh, notice of, of, some of, the, uh, of some of the great work that you're doing right now. But, uh, but it's definitely a sign of age for me. Um, so, uh, and, and, and as we're looking at, at, at the concept of aging, we're also looking at the concept of healthy aging. How do people age uh, in a way uh, that age with quality of life, age uh, with not just prolonging the duration of life, but thinking about the ways in which we improve the quality of life. And that's, I, I think, a, a very interesting uh, component of, of today's symposium. It's also a very happy day because you know we're an announcing the, uh, the the signing of a, a statement of cooperation to explore areas of collaboration uh, through initiatives such as postdoctoral exchange programs, workshops, and conferences. And we're, we're intent on, on on moving this forward in a in a positive and active way. In in the COVID period, this is a little difficult because of limitations in travel, but uh, but we're setting the foundations that will allow us to do this so that we can have a, 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 a really great and interesting exchange of, of uh, individuals and conduct further workshops, I think, on this particular su subject. And we'll also be interested at, as a consequence of today's symposium, uh, what, what new comes out of it, what new lines of inquiry and what new concepts can we bring forward. So I'd also like to echo my thanks to the, to the teams at both NTU and and uh, and UBC that have pulled all of this together in a relatively short space of time. I also want to thank all the speakers in advance because I know uh, we're we're speaking at, at opposite ends of the day here. Uh, the the uh, Singapore speakers are are speaking in the morning and uh, our speakers are speaking in the evening. But I think we we're, we're going to have a really exciting time and a great dialogue. So let's kick it off and look at how we can work together most effectively and also just want to take this opportunity uh, to wish James all the very best in the next phase. Uh, I, I know you're, you're supposed to be retiring but I know you, you, you won't be retiring <laughs> and uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to engaging with you and working with you in, into the future in whatever shape or form that takes James. It's just been such a, such a great pleasure to have got to know you. Um, now, I'm going to ask Rob, uh, Rob McMaster, who's the Vice Dean for Research at UBC's Faculty of Medicine, to offer a few housekeeping notes, and then we'll kick off. Rob. Thank you, Dermot. It's really good to see everybody, even if it is virtually. Um, so today, the format is we have six speakers, and I put today and actually tomorrow, because it's depending on which side of the Pacific we want to be on, we have different days here. So we have six speakers, which is alternating between UBC and Singapore. Each has, you know, 10 or 12 minutes to talk about their research in areas of genetics, genomics, environment, and aging, healthy aging. And we'll have questions at the end of each uh, talk, and then have a panel at the end where we can have a more open discussion, bringing in much of the data that's talked about. Um, so we're broadcasting this on the web format of Zoom, which means that the microphones are off for the for the audience. So to answer, to pose a question or a comment, use the question box, which is down at the bottom in the middle panel of um, on the Zoom panel, and we'll monitor the questions um, throughout throughout today. And um, 
there is the chat open if you want to have discussions amongst ourselves um, during the talks or with some of the speakers. And I think they'll also allow, um, we can record those chats um, so we can have, respond to them after, and say, at the end of the meeting. So I think we should just get started. So I'm really pleased to, the, Dr. Brett Finley, a colleague of all, all of ours at UBC, professor in biochemistry, molecular biology, and also a member of microbiology and immunology, and is in the Michael Smith Laboratories at UBC. You know, I think we all know Brett's internationally known both for his work in molecular pathogenesis and microbiology. I was going to say more recently in microbiome, but I think it's been in one of the founders in microbiome research. Well, today we'll be talking about the role of microbiome in healthy aging and disease, and with an example from Parkinson's disease. Uh, Brett, it's really good to see you here. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Um, everyone else on the line, it's a terrific pleasure to be here and um, give me the opportunity to talk about what I'm passionate about these days, and of course that's the microbiome and, um, <clears throat> and how it may impact on healthy aging. And um, just cut to the chase, I've worked on feces all my life, so I'm going to warn you this talk is restricted for fecal content because we are going to talk about feces. But it's important stuff. So, um, microbiome, I'm not going to say too much. I assume most people know about this. This is, of course, all the microbes in and on your body. But what's interesting to think is, um, you know, how it lives in our body over time. You know, you get colonized when you're born, and then it bumps around in terms of composition as a toddler. And then, really, most of your adult life, your microbiome is pretty constant, unless you do something like become a vegetarian or a meat eater or move continents or take antibiotics. Generally speaking, your microbes are with you for most of your life. But pertinent to today's talk is what happens once you start to age and after 65. And several studies have shown that your microbes, I like to say, almost fall off a cliff. They get very, very different as you age. And what we're now starting to realize is this event has big implications on the whole concept of healthy aging. So, you know, it, it's said, and I don't know how you prove it experimentally, but basically genes play about a 20 to 25 percent role in your healthy aging, and the environment plays the rest, 70 to 75 percent. So knowing that, that argues you can control 70 to 75 percent of your um, actual outcome in life, and it's felt that you could probably add about a decade to your life if you get things right. So the big question is, what do you, what do, you do to to get things right? So here's a rather morbid list of the top 10 reasons why Canadians die. So here's the top 10 reasons why you die. And when you look through it, you're looking for microbial diseases, of course, and there's only one, number eight, influenza pneumonia, that is obviously microbial, we know that. But what we've learned over the past few years, and I can make strong cases for nine of these 10 diseases actually having strong microbial links. And um, I'm not gonna go through them all, we'll just talk about one as an example, but um, there's in some cases it's stronger than others, but in many cases microbes play a seminal um, role in actually propagating these diseases. The one that has not had any microbial composition at all is accident, so you can't blame something on, on the microbes. Um, but all the others, there's some kind of microbial component to it. And this, I think, is a whole new way of thinking about the concept of healthy aging and disease. And with this new component that, you know, even a decade ago, that who would have thought that, you know, heart disease or Alzheimer's um, might actually have microbes involved in them. So a major tenet of the whole concept of aging is this chronic low-grade inflammation that occurs as you get older. Some people call it inflammaging. And ironically, this is very a very significant impact on the, how the body ages over time. And you know, the, the best indicator of how old you are is not your chronological age, it's not how many years you, you've been on this earth, it's really the level of inflammatory cytokines floating around your body. And as you age, these increase, and there's this chronic low-grade residual inflammation. And we all know that inflammation is generally good for fighting off infections, but we also learn through leprosy and other things, you know, too much inflammation can cause damage. And really, that's what happens as you get older, is this chronic inflammation starts to have impacts on various things. And so, well, what causes inflammation? Well, it's response to microbes, generally speaking. So what happens as you get older, one of the things that happens is your gut gets more permeable. And as well, you, your microbes in your gut become more inflammatory in composition. And so these two events combined, they become more inflammatory and they get access to the rest of your body. 
This then triggers chronic low-grade inflammation in these various tissues, and that then causes, and you can pretty much write in just what every one of the um, aging effects, uh, aging diseases one sees. It's this low-grade inflammation is causing tissue damage in, in most of these diseases. And is this real? Do we know it? Um, we think it's real. Um, experiments have certainly been done in mice where you can do fecal transfers. You take an old mouse, transfer species to young mouse, it becomes inflamed, it doesn't live as long. And even more hopefully, you can take young mice species, put in old mice, it dampens the inflammation and they actually live longer. Um, the experiment's not been done in humans, um, <laughs> but um, it's, it's a fascinating concept. You can control age by the microbial composition and this inflammation. So I'm just going to take one example. I could talk about many of these, but just the one example that I think sort of highlights this whole concept of environment and microbes and aging. And the disease I want to talk about is Parkinson's disease. So if I would ask you, do you agree that Parkinson's is a brain disease? I'm sure you all say, well, of course it's a brain disease. So Parkinson's disease, we get tremors, you're sort of stooped over, and it's caused by basically lack of dopamine, which suppresses the tremors. The cells that make dopamine die. So for years, everyone assumed Parkinson's is a brain disease. But then there were these studies coming out of Denmark where they basically had cut the vagus nerve, which is the nerve that hooks the gut to the brain. They were cutting it because these people had ulcers and it decreased the ulcer pain. And retrospectively, they realized that people had this nerve completely cut. They basically had much lower levels of Parkinson's. Um, the first study was good, but it was not a good journal, I think, because nobody believed it. How could possibly gut have anything to do with this brain disease? Then two more big studies since come out with large numbers showing that, yes, indeed, if you cut the nerve that hooks the gut to the brain, the vagus nerve, you have much lower levels of Parkinson's. And that's where this whole study, study started. Um, and I'll tell you in a bit that, that Parkinson's patients also have altered gut microbiota. And there's been even um, some, some studies about fecal transfers in mice actually affecting the outcome. Um, so you can take feces from people with Parkinson's and their spouse who doesn't, and you then put it in germ-free animals. The Parkinson's species triggers Parkinson's in these animal models. The normal feces does not. And there's, it seems to be linked to the microbe in, in the species. So there's strong gut connection. We've known about this for a while, but never really sort of put it together with a micro with respect to Parkinson's. The biggest risk factor for Parkinson's disease is constipation about 30 years before. Um, so we know constipation is a gut thing. The other biggest risk, second biggest risk factor for Parkinson's is eating red meat. Um, a red meat diet is very bad for potential of getting Parkinson's. There's other gut effects in terms of um, prolonged colonic transit time, that's like the constipation type thing. You also see small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and higher risk of um, inflammatory bowel syndrome. So, okay, well, what's the gut got to do with Parkinson's? Well, it's the microbes in the gut. And we had to emphasize that really this all seems to occur long before you actually see the, the brain disease. So the general concept now is Parkinson's happens in, or these events happen in the gut, and then 30 years later you then see it presenting as a brain disease and, and brain issue. So we've been studying this for a while now, and we and several others have done a lot of analysis of the, of the microbiome in Parkinson's disease. And we used the largest cohort so far, so far of 300 people at a UBC with 197 Parkinson's um, people in this. And what we found is that, yes, indeed, we could define certain clusters of microbes and we're very closely associated with health or Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease microbes are different than normal people, and we can certainly tell which, which are good microbes and which are bad microbes. So that doesn't really prove anything in terms of mechanism, so what we then started to do is probe, well, what are these microbes doing? And these sort of clusters of microbes, the ones that were associated with Parkinson's, um, are um, they have different effects. So the one that's associated with reduced Parkinson's, that is also associated with the production of short-chain fatty acids, including butyrate, which is an anti-inflammatory molecule um, that is um, released by the microbial metabolism in the gut. The Parkinson's um, bugs associated with Parkinson's, they, they were very strongly correlated with the um, in lower intestinal transit, the colonic transit time, and constipation. So we could actually predict who was constipated or not based on these microbial compositions. So I think one thing that tends to get forgotten in the whole microbiome world is 
forget looking at the bugs, look at the molecules they make. And this is, I think, where the next wave of the microbiome field is going to go, is that instead of trying to figure out what a thousand different species of microbes are, just look at what they're making and what are these molecules. And, you know, because that's really how the microbes talk to us, is the molecules they make. So we did metabolomics on these, and we basically were able to identify several molecules that seem to be associated with or um, without Parkinson's disease. So there's two shown on this one here. There's two uh, molecules, p cresol and, and the other one. And these show a strong correlation for being increased in people with Parkinson's. And these are, um, and I'd like to go into the metabolism of these things and things, but there, there's reasons to think that these may be associated with the whole Parkinson's type event. So even more fun is that we can actually now take the feces of people and with about 85% accuracy now, determine whether or not they have Parkinson's just by looking in the feces. There are certain microbes, some shown here, that are very strongly associated with um, Parkinson's or not. And um, this doesn't say they're causing Parkinson's, but it also feeds into the whole concept that, that Parkinson's have a certain microbial composition that's different than normal. And this composition seems to be associated with the actual disease and um, one area I think we might go in this is the idea of predicting people, take a look at people's microbes, say, oh, no, your microbes are heading towards a Parkinson's type thing. You need to change your diet or your lifestyle to push yourself away from that to hopefully prevent Parkinson's down the line. So this is also about environment, and I want to bring this concept of diets in, because whenever you talk diet, we know that diet directly influences the microbiome. And Really, you know, the expression, you are what you eat, um, should be changed to, your microbes are what you eat and they affect you. So I want to tell you about one diet it's called the MIND diet. And this is basically a combination of two known diets. One is the Mediterranean diet, which most people are aware of, and the other thing called the DASH diet, which is involved for cardiovascular hypertension type. Thing. And the, the, the MIND diet is basically, you know what you should be eating. So it's greens, fruits, nuts legumes, vegetables, um, fish, not, not red meat, um, not white sugars, white flowers type things, sweets, pastries, kind of all the stuff your mother tells you you should eat, but you never listen to her anyway. So, you know, this, and it's, this diet's actually been shown to be extremely effective at reducing the incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Following this diet can drop your incidence of Alzheimer's disease by at least um, 54%. So, it had been done with Alzheimer's. It hadn't really been done with Parkinson's. So ironically, I have a bioinformatics student um, who was mad because he got locked down to COVID and he wanted something to do. I said, well, just go mine this cohort and see what you can come up with. So we started looking through this, and one of the things of the questionnaires is, what are you eating of these Parkinson's people? And he then started to mine these things. He really asked the question, does this mind diet, people eating these types of things, does that influence the outcome of Parkinson's disease? And this paper just came out this week, and I think this is a really remarkable paper, because yes, indeed, people following the mind diet have a much, much later onset of Parkinson's than um, those that don't follow it. So you can see the data here, but the bottom line is on the second line down, where basically women, if you um, follow a mind diet, you will delay potential onset of Parkinson's by over 17 years, and then by over 7.4 years. There is no drug, there is nothing that you can do to basically block Parkinson's that, that could come, well, that does anything like this. And this is just an astounding thing, thing I think, is the fact that, you know, you're, you, just by changing your diet, you can basically block your, 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 your chance of getting Parkinson's by, you know, 17 years in women. So we were really surprised to see this, and of course, we all know that diet and microbes go hand in hand, so of course we're doing the animal studies and things and working this up towards mechanism and what is this um, diet pushing the microbes composition to, and that composition then impacting on the whole Parkinson's disease. So to sum up, I guess the major points I want to um, bring through is that the microbiome plays a major role in aging. I just gave you Parkinson's, but the cardiovascular disease, obesity, um, many, many aging um, type effects are affected by the microbiome. And just to put the whole Parkinson's story together is that the way we see this disease now is that it starts with this dysbiosis of microbes in the gut, and they're inflammatory, and, they, and you have this 
inflammation going on in the gut. And then the protein called alpha-synuclein, which is one of all the Parkinson's, is also expressed in the gut. This inflammatory gut environment causes this alpha-synuclein to misfold. And this misfolded alpha-synuclein then works its way up the, 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 the vagus nerve, sort of like a prion-type misfolding um, catalytic event. It goes to the area of the brain called the substantia nigra, which is where the cells that produce the um, dopamine live. And this misfolded protein in the substantia nigra, the brain, then kills these cells, and then you don't make the dopamine, and then you see um, the resultant um, neurological disease. So we think that by pushing these inflammatory um, microbes, you change the inflammatory environment in the gut, which then affects alpha synuclein and then the domino effect of the whole on Parkinson's disease. And then, you know, if you remember anything about this talk, is this is another plug for eating a healthy diet, the environment because not only does the MIND diet drop your chance of Alzheimer's by 54%, it delays by close to a decade at least um, um, the onset of potential Parkinson's disease. So with that, I'll close. And I did write a whole book, um, this thing on the whole body microbiome, um, which I wrote with my daughter, gerontologist, which is all about microbes and aging. And it goes through all the different um, things, the different um, aging processes and, and different organs and things. The book on the left is about the microbes in early life, but that's not about aging. That's about getting born in the first place. So with that, I will stop, and we're done. And I will end with great talk, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So George, George, Professor George Augustine is a professor of neuroscience at Lee Kong Chan School of Medicine. Uh, he has particular international expertise in the molecular mechanisms of synaptic transmission and optogenetic mapping of brain circuits. And he's going to talk to us about neuroscience uh, research at LPC. Thank you, George. Thanks, John, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about was to introduce you uh, more generally to the neuroscience community here at LPC in hopes that uh, uh, some of the work that one or more of us is doing might be of interest to you. So I'll uh, uh, start with the individuals and then mostly focus on kind of programmatic stuff. First, uh, the individuals. Uh, the Neuroscience and Mental Health Program at LKC uh, currently consists of 12 full-time faculty in the Hanson group you can see here. Uh, plus, we have uh, numerous joint and adjunct and, and visiting faculty that I won't talk to you about. Uh, everyone has their own independent research programs and their own independent research interests, uh, but there are certain common themes that have emerged, uh, which are shown on the next slide. One of them, which is uh, highly relevant to Brent, is uh, uh, a majority of us are working on neurodegenerative disorders, and you'll be hearing more about that uh, throughout my talk. Uh, and in addition, several of us are also working on brain circuitry, and uh, you'll be hearing more about that, in particular the interaction between uh, neurodegenerative disorders and their effects on brain circuitry. Um, okay, so that's who we are. Uh, let me tell you about a few of the research programs, multi-investigator things that are going on here that might be uh, potential collaborative opportunities for uh, folks in Calgary. Um, the first one, uh, which is run by Kavi Young, who asked uh, one of the questions uh, about Brett's talk, is, uh, as you can see here, regenerative medicine approach to neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, Kavi Young's specialty is in uh, Parkinson's disease, but he also works on Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. And, and uh, basically, the idea is to use stem cells um, uh, as a platform for uh, regenerative medicine. Uh, another program uh, which I'm running uh, is about dementia, uh, one of the major consequences of many types of neurodegenerative disorders. This is a five-year program that involves 16 PIs, uh, not only at LKC, but throughout Singapore. Uh, the main questions that we're asking are shown in the gray box. So. What goes wrong with brain circuits during dementia? Uh, which of these circuit defects actually cause uh, behavioral problems that are associated with dementia? And then finally, uh, how do these circuit defects arise? We have uh, teams uh, that are working on projects to answer each of these questions. Uh, for the circuit defect uh, question, uh, we're using various mouse models of different neurodegenerative disorders and soon uh, vascular dementia model. Um, to um, look at what goes wrong with brain circuitry um, in uh, these models. And I realize on the technology that I'll tell you about in the next slide. 
Uh, secondly, uh, we have a group of behavioral neuroscientists who uh, look at the causal relationship between the circuit defects identified in the first project and uh, the behavioral anomalies associated with dementia. And finally, for uh, kind of validated, as we call it, uh, circuit defects, uh, we have another team of cellular and molecular biologists whose job is to make a deep dive into figuring out exactly what causes the circuit defects that underlie uh, uh, so uh, uh, this approach is pretty unique. In particular, what's unique about it is that uh, it's comparative. So we're not concentrating just on uh, Alzheimer's disease or front temporal dementia or whatever your favorite uh, dementia-based disorder might be, um, but we're looking across them. And so the hope is to come up with common themes uh, that have escaped infection by uh, concentrating on just one of these disorders. And we also uh, we have some clinical work. We have some work on non-human primates, although it's, uh, our work is predominantly based on mouse models. And we look at uh, different brain areas, um, the cognoscenti, prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, and cerebellum are our main areas of focus. So as I mentioned, for uh, kind of the technological motivation for this whole thing, the technology that my lab uh, developed some years ago now and it's based on optic genetics. I think probably most of you are familiar with this. It's based on using uh, genetically uh, encoded light-sensitive ion channels uh, to target them to different populations of neurons in the brain and then uh, allow us to uh, very selectively turn on or turn off the activity of the neurons uh, uh, in the brain. So this allows uh, establishment of uh, causality in, in many functions, including uh, identifying uh, how neurons are connected to each other in circuits. So let me just tell you briefly uh, on the rest of the slide how this technique works. So we make uh, many different lines of transgenic mice that have channel rhodopsin in one or another kind of neuron. Uh, this particular example here uh, has neurons and uh, pyramidal cells in the cortex of the mice. And so uh, the idea is that um, uh, if we uh, make a patch clamp recording from this cell, which happens to be an interneuron, uh, it's surrounded by a, a forest of pyramidal cells uh, expressing channel rhodopsin, some of which are connected to this neuron and some of which are not. So by uh, randomly scanning a laser light spot, and we have a special kind of robotic microscope designed for this purpose, we can tickle the neurons in different places and see which ones produce a response in the neuron that we're recording from. So for example, we put the laser spot here in location one, we don't see any response, so we can conclude that there are no neurons here that are innervating uh, this cell. In contrast, if we park the laser spot at locations two or three, now we see nice responses, uh, excitatory postsynaptic currents for those of you who care about such things. And then what we can do is correlate the location of the laser spot with the amplitude of the response that's evoked to um, very rapidly and efficiently map out the structure and the function of the circuit. Um, it uh, improves the um, throughput by many orders of magnitude over previous technologies used to look at local circuits in the brain. Okay, so this allows us to look at the normal function and spatial organization of circuits, uh, a very much underappreciated topic, uh, to compare the circuit function in all these different models of dementia. And then we can also uh, relate these local circuitry uh, abnormalities to large-scale network defects uh, in our local dementia regions with our clinical partner. So that's our uh, dementia program. We have other kind of uh, programs and resources that might be of interest to uh, the folks in Calgary or even the folks in Singapore who may not know about it. Uh, one is that we have a very nice uh, human brain imaging facility on the main campus at NPU called Conic. Uh, it's kind of a one-stop shop. Everything that you'd want to do to uh, probe a human brain is all under one roof, uh, run by Galash Gulias, one of the faculty that you saw in my first slide. Um, another thing that started uh, a little bit more than a year ago and is off to a strong start is the Singapore Brain Bank. So um, this is something that's never been done before in Singapore. And it's based here uh, at LKC Medicine, the building uh, speaking from. And um, the specialty here, of course, is getting uh, local donors to contribute their brain. So uh, we'll have unique access to Asian uh, 
subject populations. Uh, another thing uh, that's fairly unique and it's just, just getting off the ground is a, a campus-wide initiative called uh, NTU Mind. And the idea is to uh, bring together uh, faculty who are interested in neuroscience or cognitive science or the science of learning. Uh, in total, it's more than 80 of us, so it's a very large organization that cuts across basically every school on campus. And uh, we've uh, presented ourselves with the grand challenge, which is to harness neuroscience insights to maximize human potential and health, which of course has strong uh, implications for aging gracefully. And, uh, that's something that's just getting started, but uh, we hope that it will have a lot of impact locally and uh, might be uh, an interesting opportunity for collaboration with our uh, partners in Calgary. So. Um, that in brief are some of the things that are happening over here in the neuroscience realm. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And, uh, happy to well, I'm really pleased to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Michael Kobar, the professor of medical genetics. Seems like he just came a few years ago. Um, he's now a full professor, senior scientist at BC Children's Hospital, and holds the uh, Canadian Research Chair Tier 1 in Social Epigenetics. Certainly, I've interacted with Michael a lot as a colleague, and really he was, through collaboration with Michael, we've been looking at epigenetics ourselves and some of our infectious disease um, areas. And today he'll be talking about epigenetic aging across the human lifespan. Thank you, Michael. Well, thanks, um, Rob, for, for um, inviting me to this, and uh, it's a real pleasure to, to see so many folks and um, face this uh, new and known. And, um, I um, want to just uh, quickly touch on uh, Dermot introduced the Human Early Learning Partnership, of which I'm a member, and it's um, really potentially some great opportunities from what you just heard from Professor Augustine, uh, because the Human Early Learning Partnership is a very unique um, entity on, uh, in Vancouver and UBC campus with a, a wonderful um, integration into the uh, public school system, into the educational system, um, a terrific knowledge to action um, um, arm to it. And, and really now pushing the society to sell a biomedical focus about how early life experiences and childhood experiences can shape health across the lifespan. And, um, and to some extent, I'll actually touch on this uh, today as well in my talk. So uh, what I was planning to do today um, is really um, two things. Um, I'd like to first introduce the idea of epigenetic and how it rel uh, relates to aging in diverse uh, human populations, so using ecological settings, um, moving from Canada to Western Africa to Costa Rica, so nice places. And then i come back to that theme of um, the Human Early Learning Partnership, which really is the idea that to some extent what we actually see during human aging, and in particular um, represented by the idea of uh, epigenetic embedding, um, could actually be a vestige of our early life environment. And so when you look at uh, this in the cost, life course, really need to sort of look from potentially from conception uh, all the way um, through to um, later life. And so most of you will probably be familiar with what epigenetics is, but uh, it really, you know, there are many definitions. Uh, one that I like is that it really refers to sort of alterations in the uh, genomic information that do not involve changes in the DNA sequence, and in some cases can be heritable um, across uh, cell divisions at least. Um, and the paradigm that we operate under is really to look at this in the context of social environments. And so the idea that um, there are certain environments, and then whether they are early in life or later in life, um, that basically in experiences that affect biological pathways and that drill all the way down into the cell to change the level of gene expression. And of course, this is not a one-way road. It could be a two-way, um, goes the other way as well. And so to understand epigenetics, there are textbooks written, but to sort of bring it down to one slide, one needs to understand that the DNA upon, um, is not really um, present in the nucleus in its free form, but it's packaged tightly into chromatin. And so if we uh, sort of look at this complex landscape of epigenetic marks and mechanisms, um, a former postdoc, uh, Maria Aristides Apalo, is now a faculty at Queen's University, recently published a, a wonderful review in PNS, where she and, uh, really highlighted all the different um, patterns that are part of the uh, epigenetic landscape. Um, there are the chromatin modifications, there are non-coding RNAs, RNA modifications, um, and, um, uh, non, uh, and of course, DNA modifications themselves. So 
All of them have a wonderful, terrific story to tell. Uh, for today's talk, I'm really just going to focus on the DNA modifications and of those only on one, which is cytosine methylation. That's really in human populations, I'd say 99.5% of all studies um, are using DNA methylation, uh, including um, 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 there are 28 uh, million of these uh, cytosine methylation sites potentially in a human cell. Generally, we interrogate around just a million for our studies. And so we can use this information that we derive from these methylation patterns in many different ways. Um, the two main ways are, are shown in the next slide. It's really we can do association studies. So we can ask of those um, 28 million, or in our case, uh, almost a million CDGs, what are they associated with? We can, are they associated with particular pathways? Um, so for example, when we look at aging, uh, are there particular pathways or loci that are epigenetically changed? Um, because the epigenome in contrast to the genome is of course uh, tissue specific, um, we need to look at this in the context of tissue. So for example, when we measure something in blood, to what extent uh, does it report, for example, on the brain? And as these numbers increase and as the um, analysis becomes much more complex, uh, our statistical tools need to be refined. I'll talk today about um, some association studies as well, but um, and they're really uh, wonderful, and John Chambers certainly has done some fantastic work in that space over the years, um, really impressive studies. Now in parallel, or slightly after, uh, Steve Horvath from UCLA came up with this idea, and, and Fred referred about the sort of microbiome inflammatory aging. There's also epigenetic aging. And um, basically the, the um, recognition was that there is this epigenetic marks, as I will show you in the next slide, they change during aging. And we can use that information to create a biological epigenetic clock uh, to determine epigenetic age. The way this was initially done means that it can be potentially a, a tissue agnostic, so we don't necessarily need to worry about measuring something in the blood um, reports on the brain or not. And it's simple statistic that um, I could even do on my own in Excel, although my students would probably disagree with me. Um, now, there are also um, other ways by which the methylone can be explored. We can look at variability overall, and we can also derive interesting secondary information. I'll touch upon uh, those as well during the talk. So how do we look at this um, concretely? So I'm going to show you an example that my uh, wonderful um, research scientist, Dr. David Lin, has uh, created from using the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging. Um, the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging is a wonderful resource with um, over 30,000 biospecimens collected from Canadians aged 45 and up. Um, we um, were able to do methylation profiling in the blood of around 1,500 of those. And so we, David, what David did here, he basically asked which of these methylation loads are associated with age. And as you can see in this volcano plot on the top, there are a number of these um, methylation loads that are both by a statistical uh, threshold that we consider relevant, but also by a effect size threshold that we sort of assume has some biological uh, effect associated with human aging. If we zoom in into some of those at the bottom, um, in, um, basically at an at individual level, you can see uh, nicely the correlations between age on the X and methylation levels on the Y axis. But you can also see there's a certain spread um, and the variability among people in those marks that are highly associated with um, aging. Now, if we then, as I said, extract this epigenetic age from these very same data, what we can see is shown in the next slide. You can see um, there I should mention there are various blocks. The initial one is on the left here, the so-called Howard block. Since uh, this was published in 2013, there are many, many different blocks um, um, that have been uh, developed and that are still being developed. Now, what you can see here is, a, again, a beautiful correlation between the chronological age on the uh, x-axis and the epigenetic age on the y-axis. But you can also, again, see quite a bit of spread. And so we can start to explore this spread. And what David did on the bottom, um, what he found is that if you're in the CLSA uh, normative Canadian population, that females tend to be epigenetically younger than males, as you can see by the, the um, average uh, size of this uh, uh, box. So in this population, this is actually true for most populations that have been looked at, females tend to be epigenetically younger. So how do we have to look at this? Um, really in a broader sense when we look at uh, epigenetic age in human health. This is taken from a very highly cited review of my former postdoc, Meg Jones, who is now a uh, faculty member at the University of Manitoba. And what Meg basically postulated uh, some years back is that when we look at chronological age versus epigenetic age, there's a sort of concordant zone shown in the yellow bar um, where most people are, their epigenetic age roughly 
corresponds to their um, to their um, chronological age. But then there are some folks, like say for example Dermot, I think he just turned 52 chronologically. <laughs> Epigenetically, he's probably like 42 because of all that soccer playing he's doing. So, um, so Dermot would be sort of in that green category of epigenetically young folks. Um, and then there are others, um, maybe myself included, that are on the epigenetically old side um, of the of the equation. Um, and, and that then translates into a different um, relative health with, of course, the epigenetically young being uh, much uh, overall much more healthy than the epigenetically old and the concordance sort of being in the middle. And that has been shown to be true for many, many different conditions, including Parkinson um, and, and others that Brett uh, talked about in the neurodegenerative states, BMI and, and so forth. So really a, a fascinating concept. Now, we have been using both of these concepts in a number of studies to understand what shapes the methylome and how it relates to human age. So in the first study, is a work we've done with uh, Louis Quintana Mercy from the Pasteur Institute and Collège de France some years ago, where we looked at um, in, like, uh, basically hunter gatherers and farmers in Africa, in Western Africa, uh, using an ecological uh, evolutionary setting. And without going into too much detail, we found that there are basically two main forces shaping the human epigenome, one of them being uh, the sort of recent um, um, forces that basically it depends where you live, whether you live in the um, rainforest or in the uh, rural city area, or um, and then the second one are the sort of more historical forces, which is, you know, in the evolutionary context, do you belong to um, one of those two groups? And so, um, and the latter one it tends to be fairly closely connected uh, to the genetics. Now. I always ask if we now look at epigenetic age in these folks, what would you bet, uh, guess would the folks that live sort of nicely in the forest be epigenetically younger than the folks who live in that sort of rural urban area or vice versa? Usually 90% of all folks think that the, uh, the people who live in the forest are epigenetically younger. Um, I'm going to spare you the quiz because I don't know how to do it online. But um, the bottom line is that actually it's the opposite that most people assume. Uh, as you can see in this paper we did with Steve Horvath in 2016, folks who actually live in the forest tend to be epigenetically older. So they're uh, two years older um, than folks living in the, um, than the average one would expect, and uh, quite a bit uh, older than folks living in the urban area. So at least in that setting, actually epigenetically, it's better um, to live in an urban environment. And I should just point this and put this in the context, a uh, difference of roughly four years in epigenetic age translates to approximately 25-fold um, uh, increase in mortality, so folks who are four years on the population level. Now, we were emboldened by this because we really realized that these uh, settings um, of, um, of ecological uh, settings, natural settings, can teach us a lot. And so uh, we strived uh, to learn more about situations around the world that we could use. And together with David Recock from Stanford University, we um, embarked on looking at the epigenetics in these uh, so-called blue zones. So many of you will know the blue zones. These are four areas around the world, usually coastal. Um, in these areas, folks um, tend to live very healthy and very long lives. Um, and so we, we are still actively working on this, but we have some really nice data from the Nicoya area, which is a peninsula in Costa Rica. Um, where we already published some work. And so this is a picture of the Nicoya area, I have to say, even though I have a grant to study, if I've never been there, it's probably maybe post-COVID uh, something to go to. Um, surprisingly, when we look at this, um, when we compare Nicoyans, so people who live in this blue zone, to Costa Ricans outside of Nicoya, we don't actually see any difference in the epi in their epigenetic age, contrary to what we were expecting. We do see uh, overall that uh, folks living in Costa Rica tend to be almost seven years younger than uh, the uh, normal sort of epigenetic, the predicted epigen uh, chronological age overall. That's something that we're still uh, um, exploring, but it has, we have uh, replicated it. Now, I talked to you about how we can possibly use this epigenetic uh, information to derive secondary um, information. Um, because we did not really see an epigenetic difference in epigenetic age here, we thought uh, we looked whether the epigenome had other information that would explain perhaps why these folks live such healthy life in this, in this blue zone. And what we found using a bioinformatic prediction of blood cell uh, proportion, we actually found that folks that lived in Nicoya actually had a higher proportion of CD18 uh, naive versus CD um, uh, memory cells. So this is really consistent um, with a um, younger immune phenotype regardless of their age. 
And so really um, interesting, of course, the caveat here that these are all predicted immune cell type as opposed to directly measured, but uh, these predictors tend to be pretty good and it's certainly consistent with the fact that the immune system of these folks might not have been used up as much as that from other folks um, that at the same age that do not live as healthy uh, lives during old age. We also looked at overall variability because the idea of epigenetic drift has been around for a long time. And what we show here is that um, when you look, compare the, the blue to the red, that the um, folks in Nicoya actually have much, um, overall much less variability in their epigenome. Um, and as can be seen already here on the right, uh, but you look at the young group, which in this case is 60 to 75, so that's actually nice that that's the young group compared to the old group, which is from 90 to 105 or 110. Um, the epigenome, the noise, the variability in the epigenome is much less in the folks from the Nicoya Peninsula, suggesting that perhaps restraining noise in the epigenome might perhaps be a secret to healthy aging. Um, we're further exploring this because it's a very interesting concept that certainly is uh, consistent with which the, with the idea that the epigenetic noise and drift could underlie some of what we see in, in uh, human aging. Now, to close my talk, I'd like to um, take this, um, take a, um, um, a little bit of a, a time back and go into early life. And this is really the idea that epigenetics has been um, emerging as one of the major integrators of the idea that whatever happens to us early in life, whether it's um, in this uh, Turing pregnancy or shortly thereafter can set us up for a trajectory that we can see all the way into eight, uh, into into old age and Dermot referred to this uh, earlier in his comments. And um, again, uh, Mac Jones, my former postdoc, has put a great uh, review together in the annual review of psychology where basically um, she uh, highlights the opportunities and, and the concept with the idea that uh, the epigenome is shaped by uh, the environment but also the genome. Uh, we didn't have time to talk about this today. And if a given exposure happens during a, a sensitive period, it might change the trajectory of the epigenome to a more risk um, um, state, like uh, indicated by this red line. When the same exposure happens outside of the um, um, sensitive period, this actually might have no effect on the epigenome and not change the risk of, say, dying early or developing Parkinson or Alzheimer or any of these diseases. This idea, of course, has been around for a long time. It's called the developmental origins of health and disease, going back to David Baker. Um, more recently, um, my great hero and former mentor, uh, the late Light Hertzman, um, who coincidentally was the, the founder of the Human Early Learning Partnership that Dermot referred to, um, really wrote a groundbreaking uh, article about a biological embedding of early experience and its effect um, on health in adulthood. Now, we have done a huge amount of work to, to test this idea. And um, it, of course, again, um, there are natural experiences such as the Dutch famine that speak very clearly to the fact that what happens early in life can stick with us, get under the skin, um, and, and affect how we age. I mean, our own work, we have uh, num published a number of articles um, that talk about, for example, uh, early life poverty affecting um, our immune function. We talked about um, how other uh, social and physical experiments um, across the world in, you know, here in Canada or also um, in the Philippines and other places do relate to DNA methylation and function of the immune system in adulthood. So really, um, um, to my, ex uh, in my opinion, suggesting that the um, early life through epigenetics in part, probably to more so through the microbiome, Brett would argue, um, does affect our health. Now, the question is, is it also reflected in the epigenetic age? And indeed, it's, it's in, a, in a paper we published uh, recently with Greg Miller and Edith Chen, who are at Northwestern and run the Foundations of Health Laboratory, we had an um, experimental cohort here in Vancouver where we were able to um, start, uh, look at the effects of low early life socioeconomic status with high early life socioeconomic status on set biological epigenetic age. And what you can see here is that folks um, who basically grow up in low socioeconomic status and always stay in low socioeconomic status during their life course tend to be epigenetically a little bit older than they uh, compared to their chronological age versus folks who grow up in high uh, socioeconomic status and especially those who always stay in high socioeconomic status that are epigenetically um, less um, um, rapidly aging. So again, suggesting that this early life environment gets under the skin and affects the rate of epigenetic aging across the lifespan. These are people in their 40s uh, right now. Um, going back to um, Nicoya, we are also then asked whether that can be seen later in life, like not just in their midlife, but you know, looking at these Nicoya folks who are in their 90s and 100s. 
and a very talented, wonderful grad student, Nicole Pladis in the lab, has um, shown, and this is unpublished, uh, but very, very um, interesting data that I want to show with you, that even here in this cohort, we can see that uh, folks who grew up when they, if they were poor in childhood, have epigenetically accelerated aging. You can see this only in the men, though, not in females. And in fact, um, so this, and, and men tend to sort of, as I said earlier, they tend to age epigenetically um, quicker than females as it is. So it's sort of like a double whammy, um, basically being a man and um, a male and growing up poor um, leads to most accelerated epigenetic aging. Um, Nicole also happened to look at this in the context of education. Um, and again, what she found is um, uh, in this population that uh, increased years of education tend to go ahead, uh, be associated with um, younger epigenetic age. So the more, epigen the more aging, the more education you had, the younger you are epigenetically compared to your chronological age. This is early data and we're still exploring this, but I want to show it to you because I think it offers some, some great opportunity to really understand um, um, aging by means of epigenetics across the life course, um, as I said. And so keep in mind, though, that all of this uh, uh, is still at the correlation level and not at causality level. But of course, um, we need to establish these tight correlations before we can think about uh, causality. So to close, I hope I've shared with you, giving you a little bit of a flavor of why I and so many people think that epigenetics really is a key component when we look at uh, human health uh, across the lifespan with the idea that, you know, early life experiences, uh, whether those are, you know, within the family, within your neighborhood, within the place you live, within, you know, the sort of um, group you belong to, um, do shape the epigenome uh, and that this can be associated with uh, changes in um, aging rates. Um, we need to, of course, keep in mind that um, there is this tissue specificity that we sometimes need to grapple with um, and the fact that this certainly also happens, as we didn't touch upon today, but it does happen in the context of genetic variation. And we do think that certainly the immune system plays a key role in this uh, circuitry. So thank you very much. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, somebody who's well known to UBC and, and, and to Dermot in particular. Uh, Professor Sanjay Chotimal, who is Assistant Professor of Molecular, Molecular Medicine at Lee Kong Chan School of Medicine, and who specializes in uh, translational respiratory research with a focus on infection, inflammation, and immunity, uh, and chronic respiratory disease in Asian populations. Over to you, Sanjay. So thank you, John, and thank you to all the organizers for inviting me to speak today. I was asked to talk about our environmental work and some of the work we're doing on air microbiomes. So um, um, I wanted to ask a question. Each day, um, as a clinician scientist in respiratory medicine, I'm very interested in breathing and air. And each day, each of us breathes 22,000 times a day, inhaling up to 11,000 liters of air. But have you ever considered what that air contains within it and whether it has any living material? So we do know about this in other planetary ecosystems, such as ter terrestrial and aquatic, where it has been quite well described that there are living ecosystems. But when I started this work, as I will explain in this talk, there was actually no real proof of a microbial ecosystem in the atmosphere. So uh, I came to NTU in 2015 uh, and met this very smart individual by the name of Stefan Schuster, who's based at the Singapore Center for Environmental Life Sciences Engineering. And, uh, and really, um, we optimized a pipeline to sample air and, and to really answer those fundamental questions. Uh, the air is collected on specific SAS filters, the DNA is extracted, thousands of sequencing libraries created, and then very elaborate metagenomic analysis is performed, which I'm happy to speak with anybody uh, offline in view of the time for this talk. So a couple of lessons that were learned very early is that the air has very little DNA. So it is quite a challenge to sequence uh, microbiomes in the air. And that is uh, just illustrated compared to soil and ocean. To make things more complicated, um, the amount of DNA in the air fluctuates over the course of a day. We get much more DNA from air samples at night than we do during the day. So Stefan published this very elegant 
study uh, just over a year ago now where he conducted a uh, five consecutive day, 24 hours a day deep metagenomic sequencing experiment where he was able to look at the outdoor air microbiome in the Singapore environment. And he really found that air was more than 50% fungal in its uh, content. But because of the poor reference databases with regards to fungi, you could only actually identify about 3% of these fungi. But I think one of the most remarkable findings of that uh, landmark study was actually that there's a circadian pattern to the air microbiome. So let's start at the top right-hand corner of this uh, diagram at about 5 to 7 a.m. in the morning, where you can see blue representing bacteria phyla and uh, yellow-brown representing fungal phyla. And as you can see, they're, they're both represented in the early hours of the morning. But as you move through the day, um, especially when you come to the evening, 3 to 7 p.m. and then 9 p.m. at the bottom, you start to see that fungi become more and more dominant. And really, fungi are creatures of the night, taking over most of the outdoor air microbiome, and again, bacteria coming back into it in the early hours of the morning. What was remarkable is that this cycle was repeated five times over in five consecutive days, suggesting a circadian rhythm to this microbial content in the air that you and I breathe. So fascinated by this and with my respiratory clinical hat on, uh, we looked at the top eight fungi in the outdoor air in Singapore. And uh, here they are listed. And we developed very specific immunoglobulin type E IgE assays against these very fungi. And uh, we compared a healthy non-diseased group with a group who have chronic lung disease, in this case, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and actually found, to our surprise, that COPD patients had measurable, measurable specific, systemic IgE um, uh, concentrations for each of these eight, or well, to most of these eight top fungi in the outdoor air. To our even greater surprise, when we separated patients that were sensitized to this fungi in the air, we in fact found that they did clinically worse. So COPD patients who demonstrated immunological responses to outdoor air fungi uh, presented with significantly more exacerbations uh, than, than those who were not. But it's not just about outdoor air. Um, we're all interested in indoor air, the air you and I breathe in our offices and specifically in our homes, the surfaces that we touch and how that interacts with the host of human microbiome. So that's exactly what we did next. And that was the question we wanted to answer. What, what, what is living in our bedrooms in the air? So uh, in an elaborate study that is uh, currently still ongoing, we have collected a whole range of clinical and environmental data and sampled outdoor and indoor air in a huge range of individuals' homes. We've also swabbed aircon filters surfaces around the home and subjected them to our low biomass protocol metagenomics pipeline. We were able to get good DNA from the air, from the aircon, as well as from the host samples, but again, only able to classify about half of these sequences. But really, one of the early messages that seems to be coming across is that there are distinct environmental signatures in the indoor air. And this is demonstrated in this PCOA plot where, for those unfamiliar with looking at these, dots closer together are more alike one another. So if you look at the balcony samples or the outdoor air samples, whether I sequence on one side of Singapore versus the other, they're all very comparable. But if you compare that to the indoor bedroom, they're actually quite different, which is even more markedly different to swabs from aircon filters in each of these homes. This really has extended to even rooms in the same building which show very different indoor air microbiomes. Again, one row here, an individual home, aircon swabs quite different from one another, but the indoor bedroom remarkably different. And when we piloted this, we did it in healthy individuals who have no known lung disease, and we were able to find specific genera and, and species, in fact, within these homes that are known to be human pathogens. For example, Stenotrophomonas maltophilia is a major cause of ICU pneumonia in Singapore. And we were able to detect it in the indoor air and the aircon filter in, in several of these homes, absent in the host sputum because these are healthy individuals and not really present in the outdoor air. So that got us thinking about lung disease and whether this air, these air microbiomes in each of our homes could be influencing uh, disease in patients who have chronic lung disease. So we are in the process of conducting this very elaborate study across Singapore, uh, partnering with several hospitals, 
And every time we go into a home and sample their indoor, outdoor air and their surfaces, as well as their host specimens, we, have, we provide an individual home microbiome report to each of our participants, which uh, interestingly was something requested by the Ethics Committee when we, uh, when we put this through for their evaluation. So again, this is early days of this study, but I'm going to show you um, uh, just a snapshot of, uh, of this type of work and, and really why, it, why it's so interesting. So this is host samples uh, comparing a group of healthy and patients with severe asthma with uh, two discriminant taxa shown on the right side. And here is an example of all the uh, home sampling that we've done, outdoor, indoor air, aircon filter. We've even swabbed the patient's inhaler as well as sputum. And the take-home point is really we do see a significant amount of environmental airway crossover. And to draw your attention to the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, interestingly, some of the discriminant taxa from the host specimen are actually found in the filter and the indoor air, but not the outdoor air. Suggesting to us that, in fact, the indoor environment may, in fact, hold some uh, significance in potentially determining outcomes in chronic we have an ongoing collaboration with UBC, um, great friends of mine, Chris and Janice, uh, who are recruiting patients across Vancouver General and St. Paul's Hospital in order to extend this indoor air microbiome study that was uh, funded through a Genome BC grant a couple of years ago. So in the interest of time, we can't really uh, talk about air without talking about dirty air and talking about air pollution. And I think um, most people are, are, are accepting of the fact that air pollution is bad and has been related to lots of different uh, disease uh, entities. And remarkably, 91% of the world's population actually live in places that exceed the WHO air quality guidelines. So this truly is a global crisis. And we need to understand, before we can look at air pollution, we need to understand um, types of air pollution. And there are persistent... Uh, Areas of air of high of poor air quality uh, indicated here is, for example, in Wuhan, China, and New Delhi. But there are also places that largely have very good quality air, but have episodic uh, episodes of air pollution. For example, in Australia with the bushfires, or here in Singapore with the haze. So we actually looked again using our low biomass protocol at several jurisdictions around the world. This is all pre-COVID. Uh, here I represent Germany, India, Singapore, Japan, and the USA. Uh, at microbial communities. And here we see that they are fungal dominant, demonstrating that diel variation and that circadian pattern um, that, I, that I showed in some of my earlier slides. But look what happens in, uh, when you sample during times of pollution. Air microbiomes become bacterially dominant, and that loss of circadian rhythm is very evident. As you can see, completely blue, full of bacteria. Here I show two extreme examples, Singapore at the top, New Delhi at the bottom, polluted on one side, clean on the other side. As you can see, polluted air microbiomes dominated by bacteria, clean microbiomes dominated generally by fungi. When you plot this on a PCOA, again, they separate out beautifully, but what was particularly of interest is that, you know, a clean day in New Delhi was quite closely related to a polluted day in Singapore. So here we go. Uh, we went ahead and uh, looked at absolute abundances of bacteria and fungi that we were getting in clean and polluted environments and, and looked at diversity indices. And one of the take-home messages from our early studies is, in fact, that polluted air actually has an increased diversity. And this is largely due to the presence of new bacteria that are not found in the clean air microbiome. particular interest, many of the microbial species in this polluted air are known human pathogens, which are not present in clean air microbiomes. And this includes everything from non-tuberculous mycobacteria to streptococcus, staphylococcus, acinobacter, pseudomonas, and fungi such as aspergillus. So in the interest of time again, in the last couple of minutes, we have a ton of data that I'm happy to discuss with anybody um, after this meeting. I think we can't get away without talking about COVID. And early in the pandemic, there were lots of papers coming out looking at whether pollu countries which had pollution or uh, poorer air quality were related with worse COVID-19 outcomes. So coming back to what we already knew pre-COVID, clean microbiomes, fungal dominated with diel variation, polluted microbiomes, bacterial dominated with loss of diel variation. 
So in our lab, we have developed uh, uh, primary cellular models, uh, airway organoids, that are de developed from adult stem cells, either by swabbing the airway, similar to a nasopharyngeal swab uh, that you would uh, do for a COVID test, or using a bronchial biopsy. And, we fi and, and, and these uh, primary uh, cell cultures are actually very highly functional. As you can see, mucus swirling in the center of one of them there. And that mucus swirling that happens is because uh, as you can see, little electric shocks around the circle here, that is because of functioning ciliary function. So the cilia are naturally beating and, and um, swirling around this mucus. These airway organoids are really useful to study um, uh, things because we can flip them inside out to make more physiologically relevant infection. Uh, and we've successfully done this for a series of organisms, Pseudomonas, Streptococcus, and even infecting it uh, with... Uh, the ancestral Wuhan strain of SARS-CoV-2. We've also shown factors required to uh, be infected by SARS-CoV-2. So really, coming back to the point of my uh, presentation, what about the cultivars from clean and polluted environments? What do they do using these airway organoid models? So here you can see the air filters that were collected from clean and polluted environments, including controls, the relevant particle, particulate suspensions, and then the cultivars grown in each of these environments. So first, we did not find any differences at the gene level for any of the major entry proteins or receptors needed for SARS-CoV-2. But of particular interest, when these airway organoids were ex exposed to pollute the cultivars from polluted environments, and several polluted environments, we did see a significant to protein. So this then uh, begs the question, and really let me leave you with this thought before I summarize, on whether or not uh, populations that live in polluted environments exposed to polluted air microbiomes have upregulated ACE2 expression and therefore are more susceptible to, to COVID-19 and, and the, the worst outcomes described in the literature. So in summary, um, air microbiomes, I hope I've convinced you in 15 minutes, are of importance and of interest, and that in indoor ones should be looked at at the individual level, and that they change in polluted environments, and they could potentially be li linked to uh, COVID-19 outcomes. I want to thank Schuster at CELSI for all this collaboration, all my funders, and all my staff and students who do all of the work that I've presented. Thank you. That's great, Sandy. Thanks. Thank you. Well, our next speaker is Dr. Chris Carlson. So we have really back to back on this collaboration between Vancouver and Singapore. Chris is a professor and division head of respiratory medicine and a, and a Canada, Canada research chair in occupation and environmental lung disease. I'm um, just also add that Chris has been a real proponent of a newly established set of clinics in BC on post COVID follow up um, of these long, long haulers with, you know, uh, not from the COVID itself, but from effects on the other organs, particularly lung and crisis sense, and following these patients after three months after. So it'll be interesting to have maybe next year a conference on, on some of these uh, aspects of COVID. Uh, Chris today will be talking, though, however, on the relationship between gene scores and susceptibility to inhaled exposures. Chris? Thanks, uh, Rob, and thanks, uh, everyone, for taking the time, especially those in Vancouver uh, waiting for dinner, I suppose. Um, I decided to uh, emphasize a, a focused issue, um, trying to share with, with the group in the hopes of collaboration um, in, in, in two ways. One, with the infrastructure we have, uh, a relatively unique lab called the Air Pollution Exposure Lab that I'll show you that I think um, could be very fruitful for, for international collaborations. Um, and on the theme of, of aging, that um, hearkening back to what Brett said, Brett said that inflammation really is tightly uh, aligned with aging, and, and so you'll see inflammation as is oxidative stress, um, all in the context of inhaled exposures, which um, you heard about a bit already from, from Sanjay. And you also heard from Sanjay about air pollution, but I, I, I tend to always show the slide because I don't think everyone realizes just how profound the effect of air pollution is. It's the single most influential uh, external cause of, of death in the world, more than smoking, uh, far more than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined, et cetera. 
uh, 9 million people die every year from air pollution. And this is not just the Burnett uh, study from PNAS, but uh, th there's another independent study that shows a similar number. So this is a well-respected um, figure and, and, and really staggering when you think about it. And it motivates uh, why we continue to push hard on, on, on understanding the effects and what we might be able to do about it. And also in terms of aging, um, air pollution deaths are uh, far disproportionately in the older populations, as you can see. Uh, the young also are affected uh, somewhat disproportionately, as you can see on the left, but uh, by far most deaths occur in, uh, in the latter uh, decades of life. Uh, not surprisingly, but nonetheless uh, uh, profound in terms of its effect. And there's a term called harvesting, which is a, it is a debunked theory that basically uh, these data just document um, deaths that were going to occur anyway in the older population, and that's not, these, that's not true. These are premature deaths, as has been shown in, in, in many epidemiologic studies. So again, our, our lab, uh, the Air Pollution Exposure Lab, or APOL, is, is in uh, next to Vancouver General Hospital um, on the campus of VGH and the Vancouver Coast Health Research Institute that uh, until very recently Rob um, was the head of. It looks like this, at least the, the center of it does. Um, this is a, a booth of inert material where there's a bicycle um, and we can uh, simulate exercise with that bicycle, et cetera. But most importantly, measure very carefully in real time uh, the exposure levels, not only to keep them safe, but to understand exactly what the components are um, and this, this facility can be used for uh, virtually anything that we can create safely, whether it's uh, diesel exhaust, which is our typical exposure, or e-cigarettes, cannabis, uh, now that it's legal in, in Canada, giving us a strong advantage in that research, um, allergens, and then we can do interventions uh, to, to see the effect. And the crossover design is critical because uh, as anyone knows, in observational studies and epidemiology, the risk for, for confounding is always present and looming, um, and, and one can try as best possible to, to account for that confounding. But in this case, when this individual, for example, in the middle uh, comes back for another exposure, he is exactly the same person, and there really effectively is no confounding um, at hand. Um, and then we can repeat, uh, repeatedly sample for lung, uh, nose, blood, or, or urine, et cetera. And the, the kinds of exposures we simulate are, are like Beijing in a, in a bad day, this is Tiananmen Square. But unfortunately, there are also exposures that look uh, very much like Vancouver uh, in the summers uh, because of the fires we've been having. Um, and I forgot to mention it, but we actually now have a wood smoke um, module that we can simulate <laughs> these exact kind of conditions um, in the lab. So it's very relevant not only to international populations, but Canada. And it's also very safe um, because at this point, usually there's a good chunk of people that think that this is uh, nuts or, or at least questionable. But you know, if you are one of those people, you can uh, read this in other papers um, that describe the safety and necessity um, of this. And I'll come back to that later um, at the end. So what we've specialized in addition to this model in general is the, the idea of combined exposures. Uh, because over the years we've shown that single exposures um, are, are important, but the real world is, is, is a mixture of exposures. And by exploring those, we much better understand the biology. And so there, there are a bunch of examples on this diagram, but highlighting in the, in the shaded oval uh, diesel particulates, diesel being the most common uh, cause of particulate matter in urban environments worldwide um, and allergens leading to a whole range of, of endpoints. And this diagram summarizes about 10 years of work where looking at allergen and diesel exhaust as these combined exposures, we talk about this black box and we've pretty much mapped out the whole series of events here and these are some of those papers. But for the for the purposes of this talk, I want to highlight that in several of these papers, there have been variants of the glutathione S transferase gene that have shown to be very influential in these endpoints, including something as, as clinically relevant as FEV1, which is the forced expiratory volume in one second, a very common measure of airflow in, 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 in lung disease. And 
we looked at these single uh, genetic variants because they're very common and influential. In fact, up to 50% of the population has these. Uh, but as I'll show you later, the purpose of this talk is to emphasize what's known as a gene score, where we look beyond a single gene and into multiple genes. Uh, recognizing that uh, co-exposure is not the same as mono-exposure, mono and it's also not the same as the additive effect of two exposures, because there's synergy um, at hand. So this kind of study shows results like this, and, and I'm not going to go into the detail because that's not the purpose, but when we do this study through bronchoscopy, giving one lung a safe dose of allergen and the other saline, we see that in these four uh, figures here, to the right of each one is the combined exposure, so DEA being diesel and allergen. As you can, and you can see in each, it's when there's the combined exposure that the effect on uh, cells such as neutrophils, eosinophils, and the related cytokines um, are, are increased. And these are all very classic, uh, well-described kind of bread and butter um, molecules in, in lung disease. But what we decided then to do is understand within diesel exhaust, since it's a mixture of particles and gases, what really was the important component or how did they differentially affect these endpoints. And so we decided to remove the particles uh, and we did that with a uh, particulate filter and we call this uh, particle depleted diesel exhaust. And it was just about this time when the Dieselgate uh, scandal came through the news and, and revealed that not only Volkswagen but several other companies um, were defeating their own technology in a way that essentially led to up to 40 times increased uh, nitrogen oxides uh, compared to what they had uh, publicized based on their idealized situation. So coincidentally, it turned out that this study design um, that, we, that we had started before Dieselgate gave us really a profound insight into what would happen with these uh, defeat technologies with increased nitrogen dioxide, because it turns out that when the particulate um, uh, filters are applied, and that's again PDDE, or particle depleted diesel exhaust, that there's more nitrogen oxides, and nitrogen oxides are highly oxidative, and again, getting back to oxidative stress as a uh, component of aging. So in this particular graph, and I know um, it, it's a bit busy for people that aren't familiar, but again, remember airflow, FEV1 on the left-hand axis, that's a very simple measure of airflow in all of our lungs. When that, those particles are depleted, counterintuitively, it's not a good thing because it's not actually the particles driving this effect, it's the gases, specifically uh, uh, nitrogen oxide. And this doesn't maybe look like much, but there's almost a 10% decrease in airflow uh, in these same people, repeated exposures, but coming back in this case in this condition where there's more nitric oxides. Now, getting to the gene scores, again, rather than looking simply at the glutathione S transferase, which you see towards the bottom, we looked at now 16 uh, 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 variants whether it's the null variant for GST or the, the various variants that you see in this list. And by looking at that score, we were able to see where you couldn't with a single gene that those individuals that were variant for a higher number of genes and so had a higher gene score had less oxidative stress defense and a larger drop in their airflow. So those that had the more variant components of a, of a gene score cross oxidative stress metabolism that were most profoundly affected by this uh, exposure. And that was also seen, I won't go into details, but it was also seen uh, not only in the lung, but systemically. Uh, so in the bloodstream, whether it's neutrophils or the various white blood cells that you see, they were all increased, particularly in those that had this higher uh, score for weakened oxidative stress. Uh, this led to some, uh, some publicity um, and in particular, it led to the concern, again, that there are some that are particularly at risk for air pollution effects. And again, uh, at, at the end, in a minute or so, I'll, I'll show why that really gets into some important uh, policy matters. It even led to a review article where the whole article was, was demonstrating that particle filtration, which was a, an important technology and widely uh, spread, actually can have these counterintuitive and, and, and counterproductive effects on health, meaning that 
the technology was tested for its effect in reducing particles, but it was never really affected in the health context. It was never affected. It was never tested on whether what it would actually do to humans um, in, in real life. And then just briefly to give you another example to show that once we saw the the effectiveness of looking at a gene score, we turned to another common exposure. Common, although not everyone's heard of phthalates, um, increasingly people have it. Phthalates are plasticizers. So in the medical environment, for example, you might see the medical tubing there. The medical tubing you see is flexible plastic, really because of phthalates. Without phthalates, it would be rigid and you couldn't bend it. Uh, but there's an emerging epidemiology that phthalates could uh, lead to asthma or asthma-like phenomena. So we designed this study uh, similar in, in terms of a crossover to the one you saw uh, previously with each individual, in this case, getting uh, both, both uh, uh, allergen with and without phthalate, again, randomized uh, double-blinded crossover. In the context of emerging challenges in Canada and worldwide and, and how to deal with the epidemiology of the effects of phthalate, we wanted to show from this controlled exposure whether the observations were actually correct in this kind of more rigorous environment. And indeed, we showed, um, looking at the green, that's the amount of airflow that's lost when you add the exposure of DVP to the lungs. Uh, or to the right, we showed that in the airway by flow cytometry that there was uh, a skewing uh, towards M2, uh, corresponding to a, a decrease in Th1 uh, cytokines. And that was, as you can see, by a large percent and statistically significant, but again, pertinent to the, to the topic at hand, we wanted to see what genetic variants might be driving that, and we looked at the PPAR, uh, uh, we looked at PPAR as a candidate, the peroxome proliferator activated receptor, as you see, and in particular PPAR gamma, because it was known in the literature to be associated with asthma and active in the lung. And interestingly, phthalates were shown to be previously uh, PPAR agonists, which would lead to an anti-inflammatory effect, because the PPAR function is anti-inflammatory. So if there were variants, it would actually increase inflammation because that anti-inflammatory effect would uh, be less robust. And I'll just show you in my last slides, uh, that is exactly what, uh, what occurred. We used a smaller um, score of four variants because these are the ones with a higher frequency in the general population that they're likely to be common enough in our hands. And we showed that in blue, which is the phthalate, DBP, that as the score on the bottom axis went up, there was actually an increase in allergen-specific IgE with that increased phthalate exposure, whereas with air, the control effectively, the opposite was true. So there's a profound gene uh, environment interaction here, but per only, only using the gene score with the four variants, but not any one of them alone. Same thing, uh, I'll just skip through this because of, of the interest of time, but the same thing effectively on uh, GCSF, which rep represents neutrophilic inflammation, um, or IL-33 for, for more broad inflammation in the lungs. So again, I said I'd tie this into uh, policy issues. Um, and in the U.S., uh, less so in Canada because of the legislation, but in the U.S. and in Europe, um, there is a, a legislation that insists that decisions are made on a combination of animal work, epidemiology, and controlled human exposures like the ones we do. Um, and there's a long history of this being uh, the basis for court decisions, et cetera. And the Clean Air Act in particular demands, not recommends, but demands that sensitive subpopulations are considered. And it explicitly goes into the sensitive subpopulations, including those that are genetically uh, altered such that they are sensitive just in the ways that I've described. And this, this is directly um, relevant to court cases where while the average uh, level of, of, of pollution may protect the population, it will not protect these uh, susceptible subpopulations. And, and thankfully, in my mind, the U.S. has had the foresight to say that if you're so unfortunate as to have genetic variation, well, you should be protected just as much as someone who has normal uh, genomics. And that's why we wrote this paper um, and looking, for example, at the, the middle panel where a community could argue that should there be enough in that community that have uh, genomic susceptibility, well, they should be able to argue for things like having their school uh, buffered by trees away from a roadway as opposed to being right on the edge of the busy traffic. Um, as sometimes is the case. 
So I'm just going to end there. Um, I'm going to thank uh, my lab um, and others uh, too numerous to, to name as well as funders. I uh, hope that I didn't go too far over time and uh, hope that we have time for questions. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our last speaker, Marie Lowe, who is uh, an assistant professor in molecular epidemiology at LKC School, LKC School of Medicine. Uh, she has a particular interest in, uh, in, in functional genomics uh, and in particular uh, role of epigenetic disturbances in health and disease and also uh, microbiome as uh, determinant of health and disease. She's going to talk to us about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the population health-based research that we do in general at LKC and more specifically that she's leading. Hey, thank you, John, um, and thanks everyone for staying to the end. Um, I'm glad I had the opportunity to share about what kind of population health and molecular epi work is being done at LKC. So I thought I would kick start um, with actually this um, overview of the primary faculty here at um, our population and global health division. So um, that's John, you see that as well as myself, um, and we have a whole um, band of joint and adjunct faculty ranging from LKC Medicine as well as with our clinical partner, um, the National Healthcare Group. So um, we have diverse interests, um, molecular, environmental, respiratory epidemiology, as well as on the health informatics, digital health, and data science end. So um, for today's talk, I'll only focus on my personal um, interest, which is molecular epidemiology. So molecular epidemiology basically is a cross between traditional epidemiology and molecular biology. And it's proposed by many to be basically the um, core power underlying precision medicine. So specifically in Singapore, um, the need for precision medicine is underpinned by the low birth rate. Uh, we actually have one of the world's lowest birth rate and um, an aging population. So despite having one of the world's highest life expectancy, in fact about one in eight of those years will end up being spent in ill health. So it then becomes critical that we have approaches such as precision medicine that will allow us to eventually have better diagnosis, treatment and management. So um, just to demonstrate multiple use cases, so um, one of them is familiar disease. Um, we also have a big role to play in um, the identification, early identification of um, individuals who might suffer from adverse drug reactions. Um, it is also useful in understanding the differences in T2D prevalence, as an example, other diseases as well. Um, we observe higher risk for T2D in Indians and Malays. And um, the same strategy can also be used for um, management of treatment and intervention, for example, um, which individuals will benefit more from a lifestyle intervention program compared to metformin treatment, a more aggressive health treatment. Okay. So this is actually accompanied by a startling gap in um, Asian genomics data. So as you can see here, um, in majority of this, ex, um, this consortium and GWA studies, you'll see that majority of them are coming from Europeans, which is marked in blue here okay, and in red here. Um, you can see that actually even if you combine South or rather Indian Asians together with East Asians, it really accounts for only a small proportion of the data coming out from genetics data. And um, this is in fact the same case for other omics data as well, including epigenetics and um, transcriptomics. So therefore this brings us to our aim of you know, conducting population health research here to, del to deliver innovative and effective approaches for the prediction prevention and control of chronic diseases um, in the hope of improving the lives and health of generation of Singaporeans as well as you know, agents in general to come. So then this leads me to introduce Helios, which is the flagship um, cohort here at LKC Medicine. So Helios is basically a longitudinal population study. Okay. Um, we started off as a 10,000 individuals pilot a couple of years back, and it's now grown to about 100K um, in the coming years. This is supported by the SG100K study, which I'll elaborate a little bit more later. The cohort basically consists of Singaporeans and permanent residents, PR, uh, ranging from 30 to 84 years old, um, including all ethnic groups in Singapore. Uh, we do make a conscious effort to oversample for the minority groups, such as Malays and Indians. So for all um, Helios participants that comes through the door, they'll be going through this um, long path that takes about three and a half to four hours. Okay. And um, that includes comprehensive clinical assessment over multiple domains, including questionnaires, 
physiological measurements, imaging, and the collection of biological samples. Okay, so apart from the more traditional measures such as um, weight, height, blood pressure, and so on, we also have pretty deep phenotyping in the field of dermatology. We do um, transepidermal water loss, moisture, pH from the skin, and also in imaging, where I look at DEXA, um, keratite, arterial scans, um, OCT retinal, as well as um, ECGs, just to name a few of them. This is again accompanied by a very comprehensive collection of biological samples. So um, even for blood itself, we do collect them in different tubes to be compatible with downstream applications, such as RNA, SEC, and so on. Uh, we also collect stool, skin tape, urine, and saliva. A very comprehensive collection here. So I mentioned SG100K briefly earlier. Um, essentially, SG100K is part of the Singapore National Precision Medicine Program. The aim there is to create a national cohort of um, 100K individuals, and um, this is done by harmonizing methods and sharing integration of data between Helios and other partners institutions. Well, so basically, there are the ones at the bottom, um, of which Helios make up about half of the SG100K. Now, um, what we're doing at the moment, or in the coming year, is to actually do molecular phenotyping uh, we'll start with whole genome sequencing and DNA methylation in the first instance, but it's expected that we'll extend to other molecular platforms, including RNA-seq and metabolomics. And uh, what will also add great value is the linkage to our electronic health record data. So now, um, basically, what the aim is that by measuring and quantifying this different omics data um, in a population health setting like Helios, this will allow us to work out the um, interplay between the environment and the omics, therefore leading us to the identification of biomarkers, pathways, um, drug targets, and ultimately better prediction, prevention, and outcomes. Okay, so um, just to kind of give us a flavor of how we can leverage on Helios um, and LKC, um, I'll actually be showing some of our upcoming work on microbiome, which is one of the cross-cutting teams in LKC. Okay. So um, we have actually long observed that overweight or obesity is associated with an increased prevalence of AD, um, atopic dermatitis, and it's also associated with the severity of AD itself. So now the hypothesis there basically will then be that adiposity promotes uh, skin epidermal barrier dysfunction through the activation of inflammatory cytokine pathways of antimicrobial peptides and barrier lipids in the stratum corneal and that these molecular processes are linked to the development of abnormal skin microbial colonization, finally leading to AD. Okay. So we've planned a series of experiments around, around that so to investigate the molecular features uh, mediating the effect of adiposity on skin barrier function, leveraging on helios. What we'll do is to actually perform skin microbiome analysis together with targeted skin surface peptides and lipids plus other serum biomarkers on 125 PET um, obese and limb individuals, Chinese for, to keep it homogeneous. And of course, age and gender match. And, and another experiment to basically one of the ways to test causality is through lifestyle intervention. Again, from Helios, you actually get 25 OB, obese participants. We will put them through a 24 weeks um, multidisciplinary weight loss program, including dietary and lifestyle modifications. And we then take skin along with stool microbiome before and after the 24 weeks as well as with the other peptides um, and lipids mentioned earlier. Hey, just wanted to highlight the Asian Skin Microbiome Program. Um, so leveraging on Helios as being a well-characterized and recallable cohort, the hope here is that we have be able to develop an integrated platform um, with, to investigate the function of microbiome in skin. And this resource is, will also be flexibly available to companies that wish to collaborate in testing their clinical and research hypothesis. So what we're doing here is actually very much in line with international efforts as well. So similar to the um, NIH Human Microbiome Project, the aim here is really to elucidate mechanisms of the um, host microbiome interaction. And as you can see here, in their phase one, they have focused mainly only on genetics and microbiome. But in their phase two, they have now done comprehensive um, host um, phenotyping as well. Hey, so um, this is actually my second last slide. Okay, I just want to basically bring up the importance of having well-characterized cohorts like Helios and how we can actually leverage on it to answer key questions that we may have with regards to genetics, microbiome associations, and um, hopefully that will allow us to elucidate the effect, the mechanisms of this association, and finally how they impact on host phenotype. 
And um, I just want to take this time to thank LKC for their support, um, for the Helios study and in general, um, and Rossi that actually is funding the LCG, which underlies the SG100K, um, Toast T2D, -to part of the lifestyle intervention, and also the transition award that is uh, actually the, um, given for the skin microbiome work. Uh, we also want to thank all the Helios study team and participants. So special thanks to um, John, who is the PI of Helios and a long-time collaborator for many of the studies, and also Assistant Prof Yu. He is the recipient of the TA award I mentioned earlier, and also my partner in crime for the skin microbiome work. So thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, it's been great talking, great, great talking, great dialogue, and uh, and really interesting conversation. So, yeah. so thank, thanks very much to everyone, and particular thanks to uh, Michelle and the team, and and the team at uh, Li Kan Cheng who worked so tirelessly to bring this together. And of course, thank yes. you all, the speakers. Very stimulating, and, and all the speakers. Thanks very much, everyone.